your stories matter. The things that you want to talk about matter. So fight for that. Go and be persistent. If you're having a day at work and you're like, oh, I'm so frustrated, go home and write. Use that energy and put that into your stories and then ha you'll have something else to show. Um, be persistent. Find ways that you can use storytelling in your life and just keep going at it and practicing. The hardest thing is when someone then goes, I can't do this and I give up. But if you have stories to tell, which you do, keep fighting for those stories. Hello, everybody who is watching this podcast. Happy New Year Happy 2024. New Year. So we are here with a special guest. His name is Charlie Price. He's a story editor and animation writer. Charlie has been working on Disney television animation for over six, six plus years and as an author and as a writer of many famous shows. He has also been working independent projects such as Nat Geo. And I think Charlie will explain to us a little bit about those projects if he can, right? So yeah. Charlie, first, please let us unwrap who you are and what took you to where you are now. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Price. I am a author and writer, um, among being a dad as well to a young, uh, almost three-year-old son. Um, I live in Los Angeles. I actually grew up not too far from where I live in a place called Pasadena, California. So uh, really close by, about 20 minutes away. Uh, always been interested in storytelling. Uh, my father was an editor. Uh, he worked for a company called ABC. So he did. He edited uh, shows, put the commercials in. My grandfather on my mother's side uh, was also an editor as well. So I would kind of grew up in a, a distance way around like the, the Hollywood area, but really didn't have any and connections. I mean, my, my dad worked there, but he didn't have any uh, connections, but I always loved storytelling. I grew up going to Disneyland because uh, mm -hmm. it's not too far away from, from where I live about half an hour. And back when I grew up in like the, the eighties, it was a lot more uh, affordable to go to Disneyland. So we were able to get a, a season pass during that time when it was uh, more reasonable. So I, I, that was like a family place uh, that we went to and visited um, and then we watched a lot of the show. So I always had an affinity for Disney and my dad loved it um, as well. He uh, he joked that he had a shirt for every day of the year for Disney. And it turns out he actually did, um, which was very impressive and kind of scary at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah, so I've always was interested in storytelling and uh, in terms of how I got to to where I was, you know, I. I I, I've had a lot of jobs. I, I've kind of bounced around from everywhere from movie theater to extra. I worked at a casino for a couple of years. Um, I've had a lot of different random experiences, but I always I always wanted to be a storyteller. And, and it, it took me about 15 years to uh, really get to where I am now. I I was, you know, fortunate I was I got a job working at Disney Consumer Products in toys. Um and from there, I was, I was, you know, had been trying to get into writing for a while and publishing happened to be next door. And mm -hmm. so my friend, uh, he was like, hey, why don't you try to see if you could do something over there? Because I was trying other routes like they have fellowships that wasn't working for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I um, knocked on their door and um, basically they have a couple of magazines and they're like, well, if you have any ideas, we'd love to hear them. So I, I pitched them a number of ideas and um I was able to work for a, the Phineas and Ferb magazine. Um, but because I was also working for one of the similar divisions, they couldn't pay me. So I was like, well, I want professional experience, but you can't pay me. So I was willing to to do that in order to have my um, you know name published in something that was public. Uh, okay. And I worked on that for a couple of years. This, these are all like side gigs. I had regular day jobs at night. I would write on the weekends. Sometimes I would be, uh, you know, just try to get into that space and, really, you know, wasn't really getting anywhere beyond the magazines and I'm mm -hmm. writing for a cars magazine and they're the editors are based out of Italy. So it was, a, it was technically a different company. Disney has a lot of like subsidiary companies, I All guess. Right. Yeah. Um, and then from there I had an idea for a book and I found a woman who, you know, she was in publishing and I pitched her the idea. She's like, Oh, we're already doing that. 
So I'm like, okay. And I tried again a little while later and they're like, oh, we're already doing that book too. And I'm like, well, what aren't you doing? Uh, Because clearly I'm not like hitting on things. So um, she later told me because I was pitching ideas that they were making, she thought maybe I might have one that they're not making. And I met with with the editor, uh, named Jennifer Eastwood. Mm -hmm. And when we met, same sort of thing happened. Either she didn't like the ideas I was pitching or they were doing those ideas. So I asked her, I said, well, what aren't you doing that you would like to do? And the subject came up about Christmas. And I'm like, well, you have to have done a Christmas book. At that point, they hadn't. Um, And so it kind of became an Ottoman Christmas book. I pitched that idea. Um, It took them six months to approve it and another six months to agree to it. And originally, it was a very long time. I was the originally I was the only author and it was going terribly. Uh, the reason being is all the people I wanted to talk to were in Shanghai building a theme park and they were obviously prioritizing building a theme park versus talking to a random guy they don't know. Um, so it was, it was kind of a, a challenge to just get anywhere. And I happened to email a friend of mine who knew a lot about this thing called candlelight where they do a lot of songs and hymns, um, at Disneyland. And it turns out she had actually pitched a Christmas book idea in 2009. Um, she is the head of the Disney archives. And she was like, well, why don't we try to partner on this um, book? So between myself and a gentleman named Graham Allen, we decided to partner on it. Now they had done so much research. They had so much material. So the book kind of really originated with them. And then I pitched my own version of it. And then together we were able to make a giant, uh, coffee table book, almost 400 pages, um, 1900 pictures in the book. We did it over about a five year period. So it was a lot of like late nights or early mornings. Um, we're able to go to the parks after hours and before hours. So that, that was kind of my first kind of big piece of how I got into, uh, like the world of publishing. And while I was there at, on, I I ended up going to a show called Elaine of Avalor. Um, and she's uh, Disney's first Latina princess. And it was my first time in animation. I worked in production um, and I worked with a lot of fantastic people um, who were really professional and knew their stuff. I, I didn't know. I, I was just learning and um, I was fortunate enough that they were able to kind of show me like how to do it and how to do it properly. And a lot of what they they talked about is it was all storytelling. So I was you know, I worked with a lot of the background artists to send. Um, make sure that their work was done on time, but also to send things to our network to get approvals. The network approves everything from the background characters, the le- the the designs of everything, scripts, and they would always have it basically in like a storytelling format. Like you'd have your main character go first in your packet and then down the line. So like your most important things are what you want your audience, which is the network to see. So they were even showing me how to do storytelling in a different format um, mm-hmm. that was when I was in production, um, but I was trying to get into, to writing at Disney. It was not, I wasn't finding any routes in, it wasn't clicking for me. So I ended up, uh, going to, um, I, I did training and I did tours at TV animation. So I would try to give everybody all the resources they can. I would show them around. And if we had guests, I would show them around as well. And I was really good at it, but I didn't love it. Um, and I think that's a mistake a lot of people make is they think because you're good at something, that means you love it, mm-hmm. um, which, which was not the case at all. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And then wow. during the pandemic, they closed the studio. Um, so I was working remotely with another gentleman and they didn't need anybody to do tours. And we recorded the orientation. And at the time I was a project hire and he was not. So they let me go. Um, but the nice part was is my boss was the head of all recruitment. So she knew where all the jobs were. And because I had worked on in orientation, I knew a lot about all the different projects that if I was just on one show, I wouldn't have known. So there was two projects and one of them, I was like, oh, I really wanna work with uh, Robert Ramirez and Cassie Brower on a show called Minnie's Bow Tunes. And I was fortunate um, that I was able to get that show to work on. Um, and while on that show, they, they were very nurturing in terms of if I had any ideas, I was able to pitch them. We are a very small crew. Minnie's Bow Tunes is two minutes and 40 seconds. So not a huge crew. I think we had 20 people, most like shows of 
like Elena, which is a very big production, had about 50 plus people because right. it was also a 22 minute show. So we were very like ragtag crew. There's there's not many of us. So we all, everybody kind of had a chance to contribute. I pitched um, a number of ideas. I pitched about 20 show ideas. And what I would do is I just email them a Word document and just keep adding to it to my two executive producers. And over time, they decided to let me pitch those ideas to our network. And if our network liked them, I would get to write an episode. Um, and my great friend and, and mentor, Robert Ramirez, had the idea of if I'm able to get two of these approved, that shows I'm not just a fluke. Like one, sometimes people think, oh, they got lucky. But two, he was like, we wanted to get two. Um, and fortunately, I was able to get uh, two approved. And, you know, wow. he helped get me. And, you know, without Robert and Cassie, like I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity. And they helped me through the process. And they also story edited my scripts to get them to where they were. And the thing that I, I loved about what Robert would, was teaching me is he was saying, I'm not trying to tell my story. I'm trying to tell your story, but elevate it to a place where it will get on television. Which is and, Mickey and me, me and Mickey and me and Pooh, right? Yeah, me and me and uh, so me and Mickey uh, is a show that I came to work on. So after I wrote these two episodes of Botoons, um, because I had the book and Minnie's Botoons, um, I got offered the opportunity to do me and Mickey. So me, me and Mickey, he's uh, Mickey is a YouTube vlogger, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. Now, they don't always say it's not, you know, it's shown on YouTube, but it was made for YouTube. So we kind of looked at like things that vloggers do and like why people resonate with, I, I follow vloggers myself, why people resonate with certain vloggers and what can Mickey do as a vlogger that he couldn't do if say he was acting in a show. So, you know, like the camera could fall over, he can make mistakes, like mm -hmm. those types of things could happen and it's okay. Um, so while I was getting the opportunity to do me and Mickey, I'm still working on Minnie's Botoons. So they gave me a month off and I had to one week to pitch all the ideas and then three weeks to write 20 scripts that are two minutes each. And, you know, we talk about emotions and fears like I was terrified. I'm like, how am I supposed to do this? Like I wrote two scripts with the help of two story editors in five weeks. And now you want me to write 20 scripts in three weeks? Um, but the team that I worked with, they were like, oh, you're going to be good. Like they had this confidence that I didn't have in me. Like, you're going to be fine. Um, but I was like, this is my shot. If I can't do this, like I'm, what else am I going to get? And it's like, it's their biggest character. Like I can't mess this up. So i you know, credit to my wife. You know, we had, we had a young, very young son at the time. So I was like, I would work, you know, late in the night I'd work on weekends. And so she would help watch our son so that I had the space to do it. Having the support of my, my wife, I would not be where I'm at without her. Uh, right. And so having right. support of friends and family is, is a huge, huge part of the creative process because they, okay. they understand like sometimes you just need space to work on your stuff. That's uh, true. So I was able to write 20 scripts, um, went back to Botoons in production, which was a hard transition to go like, I'm doing the thing I love and now I'm back to doing the thing that I'm doing for a paycheck. Um, and then they asked me to write another 20 this time. They gave me six weeks. Um, but because we'd also got a flow down, um, I was able to do them, you know, at a, at a quicker pace. Now, you know, one thing I used to think about animation is you could write whatever you want. You could do whatever you want and you do it all. And none of those are true. Um, <laughs> you could, you could do, you could have all these imaginative ideas, but you also have to imagine like, Someone's got to make that. You're going to have to have someone who can animate that move or draw that background. And, you know, if you can reuse backgrounds, you save a lot of time, a lot of space. Um, so there's a budget that goes into how many characters you can have on the screen, how much movement you can do. So, you know, if say there's an episode where like characters all get snowed in and they're in one scene together and there's two characters that doesn't cost you as much as having an elaborate scene with 26 characters in it. And they're all doing different mm -hmm. animations. So you kind of have to pick and choose your battles. And when, you know, mentioning the idea of you're doing it all on your own, that's never true. Cause with the show that I work on, we have our network team who also acts as the executive producers on the show, supervising director, someone who does standards and practices to make sure we're, we're putting in things that we want 
children to see and not something that's unsafe. We have a legal team. We have a child development team. So they're there to like help and guide of like, well, a child might not understand this word. We're going to need an explanation or this might be a challenge for our audience to do. It's all in service of the audience. What is the audience of that show? Exactly. Me and Mickey is is two to five. And if we're doing things that are for an eight-year-old, that's going to be too hard for our audience. So we don't want to frustrate our audience by doing something that they can't do or right. that they can't comprehend. So that's yeah, that, that, that makes me that also uh Charlie, sorry for interrupt. No, no. Um, uh that gives me another question that I want to ask you, which sure. are what are the most common mistakes writers make that you see regularly? Um, well, I think it I mean. I think it just depends if we're talking animation writing in particular, it's mm -hmm. knowing your audience and knowing your actors. Um, for instance, if I'm writing for Mickey, the gentleman uh, who does Mickey, his name's Brett Iwan, extremely talented. He's been doing it over a decade. You could throw things at him in terms of like he's he's recorded in. I think we've had him do like six or seven languages and thing you know, things that he will study, you know, work on the dialect to try to get it exactly right um pacing we can give him all sorts of emotions versus on me and winnie the pooh our actors are seven and twelve so you can't give them a big chunk you have to break it down for them because they're trying to focus on their character and they can only do it in, in much smaller portions because they are still growing as actors as talented as they are they they have a different capacity um so that's one of the things and also understanding like for what i do my boss is mm -hmm. the, the Disney network. If they don't like it, it Hi. doesn't go on air. So there's times like, should I be, can I be right? Or do I want a show that goes on air? And I want people to see a show. That's my job is to get a show on air, not to be right. So there's times where we'll change things. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, but you know, they all have a certain expertise that I don't have. So I have to trust them as much as they trust me. And the nice part is, is there's a lot of trust within our team. I, I was able to do one episode on Dia de los Muertos. And for that episode, it was based off of my best friend who had passed away about five months earlier. And they were so caring in dealing with that episode. And I, I told them, like, there's one line in there, like, I won't fight you on anything else. But if if you change this line, we're going to have an issue. Um, and they were <laughs> they were very caring. But that's also like, picking your battles. And it's also a lot about communication as well. But those are the things I would say is like understanding your audience mm -hmm. um, and understanding the people that you work with as well and the actors. Um, because if you can get the tone of the actors down, if, if they have certain funny things, for instance, Brett, when he's kind of just messing around, he can be very sarcastic. So I'm like, how can I get a sarcastic version of Mickey? Because that's not who Mickey typically is. So we made one with a puppet named Kelly the Puppet. And Kelly just has that sarcastic tone that Brett uses. Um, so it's it's having those moments. Um, but in terms of like, there's times where sometimes I'll, I'll be writing Mickey and I'm like, I don't feel like I know this character, even though I've written 92 episodes with Mickey and Minnie. So there's that doubt sometimes kind of creeps in um, and that that worry and that fear. Um, but with those those first 20 episodes, I was able to get them all done with the help of our network team, I asked, you know, yeah. a lot of questions, a lot of help. Uh, we wrote another 20 and then I was off for a couple months. Um, so that's also what happens with writers yeah. as well. There's yeah. times where you're working and sometimes when you're not working and that's, that's the hardest time. And one of the things that I tend to do, and I, I also suggest for any of you out there is if you're not working right, but also network, talk to people get to connect with others, connect with other writers, connect with friends, connect. If you can find anybody in the industry to talk to at all, have those conversations just to have, you know, a meet and greet or a friendly face. Cause you never know, like something they say might inspire you or maybe on something down the line, they may have an opportunity for you. Um, sure. I'll give you an example. One of the books that I'm working on um, that's coming out later this year, it, it's revolving around Disneyland. And I tend to, I'm, I'm a very curious person by nature, similar to Mickey. Um, and I, I read a lot, you know, of books with my son. He's, he's of that age where he loves reading a ton of books. And one of the books, I, I tend to look at the authors and like, who is this author? If I, if we, if we like the author, does the author have more things that we can read? 
And one of the authors that I, I looked up, she had written 200 children's books. It's like, wow, how do you do that? Like, what is, and I, I went on LinkedIn and I found her and I asked her, I was like, how did you do this? And for her, she had come from a publishing background. She understood the business. She also had the connections and the creativity. So with those three things combined, she was able to work. And she had suggested, hey, why don't you reach out to this guy named Paul who works at Inside Editions? And I did. And this was the time I wasn't working. Um, it was July. And in November, I got an email from Paul. He was like, hey, there's this project involving Disneyland. I know you wrote this book. Can we meet? Um, and we met. And I was like, this sounds amazing. I'd love to do it. But that was months down the line. And I was also not working at the time. So you never, ever know. So networking is such a huge part of it. And it's also yeah. finding those routes of like, where can you be creative in your own, in your work? If there's opportunities. How do you, how can you define or on your, on your own words, how do you think the role as a story editor, editor has evolved in this digital media or digital mm. age? So I think that the, the challenge with that question is story editors, depending on the project can do something very different. So if I'm on a 11 minute show, which I have friends who are on, they have a very different role than I do. I think for me, Mickey and me and Winnie the Pooh, it's very specialized because a typical show will have storyboard artists and executive producers and then the network. Um, but I'll, speaking to my experiences um, as a story editor on the team, uh, what I what I do, I work with two other writers who are both uh, fantastic. Um, and together, what we first do is we brainstorm ideas of like, hey, what what do we want types of stories that we want to tell? And we also hear from our networking team of like, what stories do they want us to tell? Because they may have certain things with me and Winnie the Pooh. It's it's supportive of another show called Playdate with Winnie the Pooh. So we we look to see the things that they're doing. And then we all pitch out ideas together. And, and basically a lot of what that is, is then everybody takes everything and go, I'll take some of that. I'll take some of that. And that will be our story. Um, and so a lot of what, as a story editor that I do is I work with the writers. I also write a couple episodes myself of trying to get the story that they're trying to tell to a place mm -hmm. where it's then it goes to our network and then they approve it. Um, so it's a lot of, we, we try to work with making sure we get the voices down of the characters that are the uh, attitude. Also making sure that things are to time. That's a big part of it. So we only have two minutes Uh, not a lot of time. So there might be a lot of things we, we want to say, but then how can you say those, you know, those four sentences in one or two? Is there a way to do that that keeps your story um, integrity for that particular episode? Or if, if our network is bumping on something, we get together and go, okay, why, why are they bumping on this? Um, and a lot of it is also to like, people feed off each other's energy, right? So if I'm very chaotic and angry, how is that going to affect everybody else on the show? I may get notes that I'm like, oh, I can't, why are they giving me that note? And I let myself emotionally process it. And then I go, okay, so what are they trying to say? What are they trying to tell me? So a lot of it is like the, the right. energy and the pacing of what you give, if that makes sense sense to you yeah, that makes sense yeah. uh charlie uh we're almost ending the podcast and we are very thrilled and it's so you have been such a good talk you have been to i mean a lot from many jobs and then getting fired and then trying to get into the industry it has been very hard but these stories really inspire many other young professionals that might be in your shoes like 10 years before. So the question is, Charlie, what advice would you give to these aspiring animation writers that want to get into the industry? First of all, first of all, your stories matter. The things that you want to talk about matter. So fight for that. Go and be persistent. If you're having a day at work and you're like, oh, I'm so frustrated, go home and write. Use that energy and put that into your stories and then ha you'll have something else to show. Um, be persistent, find ways that you can 
use storytelling in your life and just keep going at it and practicing. The hardest thing is when someone then goes, I can't do this and I give up. But if you have stories to tell, which you do, keep fighting for those stories. Keep trying to meet people, keep talking. There's days where things aren't going to go your way. Things are going to be terrible. Other days, they're going to be fantastic. But if you keep going at it and know that you matter and that your stories matter, that's what's going to get you there. Uh, one last question, Charlie. What can we expect from you this year, 2024? Ah, um, so me and Mickey is um, still on the air. Uh, so that is on YouTube. You can find that. Um, we're going to be celebrating our 90th episode uh, through Valentine's Day. And then um, more me and Winnie the Pooh. We have that uh, coming out uh, throughout the year. That is also on YouTube. You can also find those on uh, YouTube and Disney Plus as well. And thank you both for having me here.